sexual reproduction in uh, flowering plant chapter 2 ncrt 12 chapter 2 sexual reproduction in flowering plant let's start this chapter are we not lucky that plants reproduce sexually the myriads of flowers that we enjoy gazing at the scents and the perfumes that we swoon over the rich colors that attract us are all there are an aid to sexual reproduction flowers do not exist only as to be used for own selfishness all flowering plants all flowering plants show sexual reproduction a look at the diversity of structures of the inflorescent flowers and floral parts shows an amazing range of adaptations to ensure the formation of the end products of the sexual reproduction the fruits and seeds in this chapter let us understand the morphology structure and the processes of sexual reproduction in flowering plants particularly in angiosperms flower a fascinating organ of angiosperms the human being have had an intimate relationship with flowers since time immemorial flowers are objects of aesthetic ornamental social religious and cultural value they have always been used as symbols for conveying important human feelings such as love affection happiness grief mourning uh, like uh, etc list at least five flowers of ornamental value that are commonly cultivated at uh, the homes and in gardens find out the names of five more flowers that are used in social and cultural celebrations in our fa- in your family that have you heard the uh, floriculture what does it refer to to a biologist the flowers are morphological and embryological marvel and the sites of sexual reproduction in class 11 we have read the various parts of the flower the figure 2.1 shows uh, will help you to recall the parts of a typical flower can you name the two parts uh, in a flower in which the two most important units of the sexual reproduction that develop So let's uh, let's take a look on the flower. Let's take a look on flower. There you can see the ovary, then the sepal, the filament, petal, and anther, stigma, that style. Take a look on the flower. Then let's go to the topic. The pre-fertilization. structures and uh, events the pre fertilization structures and uh, events we have to go for much before the actual flower is seen on a plant the decision that the plant is going to flower has taken place several hormonal and structural changes are initiated which lead to the differentiation and further development of the floral primordium inflorescences are formed which bear the floral buds and then the flower inflorescences are formed which bear the floral buds and then the flower in the flower the male and female reproductive structures structures like uh, androecium and gynaecium differentiate and develop you would recollect that uh, that androecium consists of uh, the whole of uh, stamens uh, representing the male reproductive organ and the gynaecium represents the female reproductive organ the gynaecium represent the female reproductive organ and androecium represent the male reproductive organ let's take uh, the stamen microsporangium and pollen grain that uh, uh, figure 2.2a shows the two parts of the typical stamen the long and slender stalk called the filament the long and slender stalk called the filament and the terminal generally bilobed structure called answer the proximal end of the filament is attached to the thalamus or the petal of the flower the number and length of stamens are variable in flowers of different species if you were to collect a stamen each from 10 flowers the each from different species and arrange them on a slide you would be able to appreciate the large variation in size seen in nature the careful observation of each stamen under a detecting microscope and making neat diagrams would elucidate that uh, range in shape and attachment of the anthers in different flowers 
a typical angiosperm anther is bilobed a typical angiosperm anther is bilobed with each lobe having two theca that means they are uh, dithecas a typical angiosperm anther is bilobed with each lobe having two theca that is uh, they are dithecas often a longitudinal groove runs lengthwise separating the theca that uh, let us understand the various types of the tissues and their organization in the transverse section of an anther the bilobed nature of an anther is very distinct in the transverse section of the anther the anther is four sided the anther is four sided tetragonal structure consisting of four microsporangia located at the corners two in each lobe the anther is four sided tetragonal structure consisting of four microsporangia located at the corners two in each lobe the microsporangia develop further and become pollen sacs the microsporangia develop further and they become pollen sacs they extend longitudinally all through the length of an anther and are packed with the pollen grains the microsporangia develop further and become pollen sacs and extend longitudinally all through the length of an anther and are packed with the pollen grains structure of microsporangium in a transverse section a typical microsporangium appears in a transverse section a typical microsporangium appears near circular in outline it is generally surrounded by four wall layer generally microsporangium surrounded by four wall layer the epidermis endothecium middle layers and the tapetum epidermis endothecium middle layers and the tapetum the outer three wall layers perform the function of the protection and help in dehiscence of an anther to release the pollen the innermost wall layer is the tapetum and it nourishes uh, the developing pollen grains tapetum nourishes the developing pollen grain cells of the tapetum possess dense cytoplasm and generally have more than one nucleus cells of the tapetum possess the dense cytoplasm and generally have more than one nucleus can you think of how tapetal cells could become binucleate when the anther is young a group of compactly arranged homogeneous cells called sporogenous tissue occupies the center of each microsporangium when the anther is young a group of compactly arranged homogeneous cells called the sporogenous tissue occupies the center of each microsporangium next microsporogenesis as the anther develops the cells of the sporogenous tissue undergo meiotic division and to form the microspore tetrads what would be the ploidy of the cells of the tetrads that and the anther, the anther develops the cells of the sporogenous the tissue undergo meiotic division to form microspore tetrads at each cell of the sporogenous tissue is capable of giving rise to a microspore tetrad as each cell of the sporogenous tissue is capable of giving rise to a microspore tetrad each one is a potential pollen or microspore mother cell each one is a potential pollen or a microspore mother cell the process of formation of microspores from a pollen mother cell pmc process of formation of a microspore from a pollen mother cell through meiosis is called microsporogenesis it's called microsporogenesis the microspores as they are formed are arranged in cluster of four cells we call microspore tetrad as anthers mature and dehydrate the microspores disassociate from dissociate from each other and develop into pollen grains as anthers mature and dehydrate the microspore dissociate from each other and develop into pollen grains inside each microsporangium several thousands of microspores or pollen grains are formed that are released with the dehiscence of anther 
inside each microsporangium several thousands of microspores or pollen grains are formed that are released with the dehiscence of anther next pollen grain the pollen grains represent the male gametophyte if you touch the open anthers of hibiscus or any other flower you would find the deposition of yellowish powdery pollen grains on your finger sprinkle these grains on a drop of water taken on a glass slide and observe under microscope you will really imagine that the variety of architecture sizes shapes colors design seen on the pollen grains from different species pollen grains are generally spherical measuring about 25 to 50 micrometers in diameter pollen grains are generally spherical measuring about 25 to 50 micrometers in diameter it has a prominent two layered wall it has a prominent two layered wall the hard outer layer is called called the exaim is made up of uh, sporopollenin that uh, made up of sporopollenin which is uh, one of the most resistant organic material known it can withstand high temperatures and strong acids and alkali no enzyme that degrades sporopollenin is so far known pollen grain exaim has prominent apertures called germ pores where sporopollenin is absent the pollen grains are well preserved as fossils because the presence of sporopollenin the pollen grains are well preserved as fossils because the presence of sporopollenin the exaim exhibits a fascinating array of patterns and designs why do you think the exaim should be hard what is the function of the germ pore the inner wall of the pollen grain is called inthain inner wall of the pollen grain is called the inthain it is a thin and continuous layer made up of cellulose and pectin it is a thin and continuous layer made up of cellulose and pectin the cytoplasm of pollen grain is surrounded by a plasma membrane cytoplasm of pollen grain is surrounded by a plasma membrane when the pollen grain is mature it contains two cells vegetative cell generative cell that when the pollen grain is mature it contains two cells vegetative cell and generative cell vegetative cell is bigger and has abundant food reserve vegetative cell is bigger and has abundant food reserve and a large irregularly shaped nucleus the vegetative cell is bigger and abundant food reserve and large irregularly shaped nucleus the generative cell is small and floats in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell the generative cell is small and floats in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell it is spindle shaped with a dense cytoplasm and a nucleus in over 60% of angiosperms pollen grains are shed at this two cell stage you know 60% of angiosperms pollen grains are shed at this uh, two cell stage in the remaining species the generative cell divides mitotically to give rise to the two male gametes before pollen grains are shed that means three cell stage in the remaining species the generative cell divides mitotically to give rise to the two male gametes before pollen grains are shed pollen grains of many species cause several allergies and bronchial afflictions in some people often leading to chronic respiratory disorders like asthma bronchitis etc it may be mentioned that parthenium or carrot grass that came to india as a contaminant with imported wheat has become ubiquitous in occurrence and caused this pollen allergy pollen grains of many species cause several allergies and bronchial afflictions in some people often leading to chronic respiratory disorders like asthma and bronchitis etc it may be mentioned that the parthenium or carrot grass that came in into, into india as a contaminant with imported wheat has become ubiquitous in occurrence and causes the pollen allergy pollen grains are rich in nutrients it has became a fashion in recent years to use pollen tablets as food supplement in western countries a large number of pollen products in the form of tablets and syrups are available in the market pollen consumption has been claimed to increase the performance of the 
athletes and race horses. Then once they are shed, pollen grains have to land on the stigma before they lose viability if they have to bring about the fertilization. When once the pollen grains shed, that they have to land on the stigma before they lose viability if they have to bring about the, the fertilization. How long do you think the pollen grains remain viability, retain viability? How long do you think the pollen grains retain viability? The period for which pollen grains remain viable is highly variable and to some extent depends upon the prevailing temperature and humidity. The viability depends that uh, upon the prevailing temperature and humidity. In some cereals such as rice and wheat, such cereals like rice, wheat and pollen, uh, in that, pollen grains lose viability within 30 minutes of their release. And in some members like uh, rose AC, leguminacy, solanacy, they maintain viability for months. You may have heard the storing semen or sperms of many animals, including humans, for artificial insemination. It is possible to store pollen grains of a large number of species per year in liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees centigrade. At minus 196 degrees centigrade, we can store. That is possible to store pollen grains of a large number of species per year in liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees centigrade. Such stored pollen can be used as pollen banks similar to seed banks in crop breeding programs. The pistil, megasporangium, the pistil, megasporangium, ovule and embryo sac. The gynoecium represents the female reproductive part of the flower. The gynoecium may consist of a single pistil, monocarpillary, or may have more than one pistil, multicarpillary. When there are more than one, the pistils may be fused together, thin carpus, you see, or may be free apocarpus. Okay, so let me go for this. The gynoecium represents the female reproductive part of the flower. The gynoecium may consist of a single pistil, consists of a single pistil, monocarpillary, or may have more than one pistil, multicarpillary. When there are more than one, the pistils may be fused together, thin carpus, or may be free, apocarp. So each pistil has three parts, stigma, style, ovary. Each pistil has three parts, stigma, style, and ovary. The stigma serves as a landing platform for pollen grains. Stigma serves as a landing platform for pollen grains. The style is the elongated slender part beneath the stigma. Style is the elongated slender part beneath the stigma. The basal bulged pore part of the pistil is the ovary. The basal bulged part of the pistil is the ovary. Inside the ovary is the ovarian cavity. Locule. Inside the ovary, the ovarian cavity. Locule. The placenta is located inside the ovarian cavity. Placenta is located inside the ovarian cavity. Recall the definition and types of the placentation that you have studied in. Uh, the class 11, arising from the placenta or the megasporangia, arising from the placenta or megasporangia, commonly called ovules. The number of ovules in an ovary may be one, like wheat, paddy and mango, or too many, papaya, watermelon and orchid. The number of ovules in ovary may be one, like wheat, paddy and mango, the too many, papaya, watermelon and orchids. Megasporangium, ovule. Let us familiarize ourselves with the structure of a typical angiosperm ovule. The ovule is a small structure attached to the placenta by means of a stalk called funicle. The body of the ovule fuses with the punk that funicle in the region is called hilum. The body of the ovule fuses with the funicle in the region called hilum. The hilum represents the junction between the ovule and funicle. The hilum represents the junction between the ovule and funicle. Each ovule has 
वन आर टू प्रोटेक्टिव एनवेलप्स कॉल इंटेग्यूमेंट्स इच ओवियल हैव वन आर टू प्रोटेक्टिव एनवेलप्स कॉल इंटेग्यूमेंट्स इंटेग्यूमेंट्स एंटरकिल द न्यूसिलस एक्सेप्ट एट द टिप वेर ए स्मॉल ओपनिंग कॉल द माइक्रोफाइल इज ऑर्गेनाइज्ड स्मॉल ओपनिंग कॉल द माइक्रोफाइल इज ऑर्गेनाइज्ड Opposite the micropylar end is the chalaja. Opposite the micropylar end is the chalaja, representing the basal part of the ovule. So let's uh, take a look and make a sparangium. Let us familiarize ourselves with the structure of typical angiosperm ovule. The ovule is small structure attached to the placenta by means of a sac called finicule. The body of the ovule fuses with the finicule in the region called hilum. The hilum represents the junction between the ovule and finicule. Each ovule has one or two protective envelopes called integuments. Integuments encircle the nucleus except at the tip where a small opening called micropyle is organized. Opposite the micropylar end is the chalaja, representing the basal part of the ovule. Enclosed within the integuments is a mass of cells called nucleus. Enclosed within the integuments is a mass of cells called nucleus. Cells of the nucleus have abundant reserve food material. The cells of the nucleus have abundant reserve food material. Located in the nucleus is the embryo sac or female gametophyte. Located in the nucleus is the embryo sac or female gametophyte. An ovule generally has a single embryo sac. Formed from a megaspore, an ovule generally has a single embryo sac formed from a megaspore. Megasporogenesis—the process of formation of megaspores from the megaspore mother cell. The process of formation of megaspores from the megaspore mother cell is called megasporogenesis. The process of formation of megaspores. From the megaspore mother cell is called megasporogenesis. Ovules generally differentiate a single megaspore mother cell. Ovules generally differentiate a single megaspore mother cell in the microphylar region. Ovules generally differentiate a single megaspore mother cell (MMC) in the microphylar region. In the microphylar region of the nucleus. It is a large cell containing dense cytoplasm and a prominent nucleus. The MMC undergoes meiotic division. What is the importance of the MMC undergoing meiosis? Meiosis results in the production of four megaspores. Meiosis results in the production of four megaspores, like the female gametophyte. In a majority of flowering plants, one of the Megaspore is functional, while the other three degenerate. In majority of flower plant, flowering plants, one of the megaspore is functional, while the other three degenerate. Only the functional megaspore develops into the female gametophyte. Only the functional megaspore develops into the female gametophyte, fight embryo sac. We say this method of embryo sac formation from a single megaspore is termed as Monosporic development is termed as monosporic development. What will be the ploidy of the cells of the nucleus (MMC), the functional megaspore, and female gametophyte? What will be the ploidy of the cells of nucleus (MMC), functional megaspore, and female gametophyte? To be fine. Let us study the formation of the embryo sac in a little more detail. The nucleus of the functional megaspore divides mitotically to form two nuclei, which move to the opposite pole, forming the two nucleate embryo sac. The two more sequential mitotic nuclei are developed, results in the formation of four nucleates and later eight nucleate stages of the embryo sac. It is uh, of interest to note that these mitotic divisions are strictly free nuclear. That is, nuclear divisions are not followed immediately by cell wall formation. After the eight nucleate stage, cell walls are laid down, leading to the organization of the typical female gametophyte or embryo sac. 
observe the distribution of the cells inside the embryo sac the six of the eight nuclei are surrounded by cell walls and organized into cells the remaining two nuclei called polar nuclei are situated below the egg operators in the large central cell so there is a characteristic distribution of the cells within the embryo sac three cells are grouped together three cells are grouped together at the micropylar end and and, and constitute the egg operators the egg operators in turn consists of two synergids and one egg cell the egg operators in turn consists of two synergids and one egg cell the synergids have special cellular thickening at the micropylar tip called filiform operator which play an important role in uh, guiding the pollen tubes into the synergies three cells are at the chalagel end and uh, are called antipodal the large central cell as mentioned earlier has two polar nuclei that uh, thus a typical angiosperm embryo sac at maturity so eight nuclei and seven cell eight nuclei and seven cell that's it. next pollination in the first preceding sections we have learned that the male and female gametes in flowering plants are produced in the pollen grain and embryo sac respectively as both types of gametes are non motile they have to be brought together for fertilization to occur how is this achieved pollination is a mechanism to achieve this objective transfer of pollen grain shed from the anther to the stigma of a pistil is termed pollination the transfer of pollen grain shed from the anther to the stigma of a pistil is termed pollination the flowering plants have evolved an amazing area for adaptation to achieve pollination they make use of external agents to achieve pollination can you list the possible external agents kinds of pollination depending on the source of pollen depending on the source of pollen pollination can be divided into three types autogamy in this type the full pollination is achieved within the same flower autogamy with the pollination achieved within the same flower transfer of the pollen grain from the anther to the stigma of the same flower in a normal flower which opens the expo which opens and exposes the anthers and the stigma complete autogamy is rather rare a normal flower which opens ex uh, and exposes the anther and stigma complete autogamy is rather rare autogamy in such flowers requires the synchrony in pollen release and stigma receptivity and also the anther and uh, the stigma and and also the anthers and the stigma should lie close to each other so that the self pollination can occur some plants such as viola common uh, pansy axalis and uh, pomelina produce two types of flower chasmogamous flowers which are similar to the flowers of other species with exposed anthers and stigma and uh, cleistogamous flowers which do not open at all so that some plants such as uh, viola common pansy axalis and camellia produce two types of flowers chasmogamous flowers which are similar to the flowers of other species with exposed anthers and stigma and cleistogamous flowers which do not open at all in such flowers the anthers and stigma lie close to each other the flowers and anthers and stigma lie close to each other when anthers they hide in the flower buds pollen grains so in such flowers the anthers and stigma lie close to each other when anthers they hide in the flower buds the pollen grains come in contact with the stigma to affect the pollination thus cleistogamous flowers are invariably autogamous as there is no chance of the cross pollen landing on the stigma so when anthers dehyde in the flower buds the pollen grains come in contact with the stigma to affect pollen pollination thus cleistogamous flowers are invariably autogamous as there is no chance of the cross pollen landing on the stigma cleistogamous flowers produce 
a shoot seed set even in the absence of pollinator do you think that the cleptogamy is advantageous or disadvantageous to the plant why next second one gaitanogamy gaitanogamy transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma of another flower of the same plant transfer of pollen grain from the anther to the stigma of another flower of the same plant also the gaitanogamy is functionally cross pollination involving a pollinating agent genetically it is similar to the autogamy also the gaitanogamy is functionally cross pollination involving a pollinating agent but genetically it is similar to the autogamy since the pollen grains come from the same plant xenogamy transfer of the pollen grain from anther to the stigma of a different plant transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma of a different plant this is the only type of pollination which during pollination brings genetically different types of pollen grains to the stigma that xenogamy is the only type of pollination which during pollination brings genetically different types of pollen grains to the stigma next agents of pollination plants are used to abiotic that means wind and water one biotic that means animal agents to achieve pollination plant use to abiotic and one biotic agents to achieve pollination majority of plants are biotic agents are for pollination majority of plants use biotic agents for pollination only a small proportion of the plants use abiotic agents only a small proportion of plants use abiotic agents pollen grain coming in contact with the stigma is a chance factor in both wind and water pollination pollen grains coming in contact with the stigma is a chance factor in both wind and uh, water for that uh, pollination so to compensate for these uncertainties and associated loss of pollen grains the flowers produce enormous amount of the pollen when compared to the number of ovules available for pollination to compensate for the uncertainties and associated loss of a uh, grain pollen grain the flowers produce enormous amount of the pollen and when compared to the number of ovules available for pollination pollination by wind is more common among the biotic pollination wind pollination also required that the pollen grains are the light and non sticky so that they can be transported in wind current they often possess well exposed stamens so that the pollens are easily dispersed into wind current and large often weathery feathery stigma to easily trap air borne pollen grains wind pollinated flowers often have a single ovule in each ovary wind pollinated flowers often have a single ovule in each ovary and numerous flowers packed into an inflorescence a familiar example is the corn cap a familiar example for this is corn cap the tassels you see are nothing but the stigma and the style which wave in the wind to trap pollen grains wind pollination is quite common in grasses wind pollination is quite common in grasses pollination by water is quite rare in flowering plants and is limited to about uh, and is limited to about 30 genera mostly monocotyledons pollination by water is quite rare in flowering plants and is limited to about 30 genera mostly monocotyledons as again is this you would recall that water is regular mode of transport for the male gametes among the lower plant groups such as algae bryophytes and uh, Teredophytes. As again as this, you will recall that that water is regular mode of transport for the male gametes among the lower plant groups such as algae, bryophytes, and teredophytes. It is believed, particularly for some bryophytes and teredophytes, that their distribution is limited because of their need for water for the transport of male gametes and fertilization. It is believed that the particularly for some bryophytes and teredophytes. the distribution is limited because of the need of water for the transport of male gametes and fertilization some examples of water pollinated plants are valisneria hydrilla which grow in fresh water and several marine tea grasses such as jostera so examples valisneria 
example for the water pollinated plants valisneria hydrilla which grow in fresh water and several marine sea grasses like uh, joostera not all aquatic plants use water for pollination in a majority of aquatic plants such as water hyacinth and water lily water hyacinth and water lily the flowers emerge above the level of water and uh, are pollinated by insects or wind and uh, most of the uh, as in the most of the land uh, plants okay so water hyacinth and water lily are the flowers their flowers emerge above the level of water and pollinated by insects or wind as in most of the land uh, plants in valisneria the female flower reach the surface of water by the long stack and the male flowers are pollen grains are released onto the surface of water in valisneria the female flower reach the surface of water by the long stack and the male flower are pollen grains are released onto the surface of water they are carried passively by water current some of them eventually reach the female flowers and the stigma some of them eventually reach the female flowers and the stigma in another group of water pollinated let's say like valisneria valisneria the female flower reach the surface of water by the long stalk and the male flowers are pollen grains are released onto the surface of water they are carried passively by water current some of them eventually reach the female flowers and the stigma in another group of water pollinated plants such as sea grasses sea grasses the female flowers remain submerged in water female flowers remain submerged in water and the pollen grains are released inside the water pollen grains in many such species are long ribbon like and they are carried passively inside the water some of them reach the stigma and achieve pollination Okay, so in case of sea grasses, the female flowers remain submerged in water, and the pollen grains are released inside the water. Pollen grains in many such species are long, ribbon-like, and they are carried passively inside the water. Some of them reach the stigma and achieve pollination. In most of the water-pollinated species, pollen grains are protected from wetting by a mucilaginous covering. in most of the water pollinated species the pollen grains are protected from wetting by a mucilaginous covering both wind and water pollinated flowers are not very colorful and do not produce nectar what would be the reason for this majority of flowering plants use a range of animals as pollinating agents bees butterflies flies beetles wasps ants moths birds sun birds and humming birds uh, that in case of birds and bats are common pollinating agents among the animals insects particularly bees are the dominant among the animals insects particularly bees are the dominant biotic pollinating agents even larger animals such as some primates like uh, lemurs arboreal tree dwelling rodents are even reptiles like gecko lizard and garden lizard have also been reported as pollinators in some species often flowers of animal pollinated plants are specifically adapted for a particular species of animal majority of insected uh, majority of insect pollinated flowers are large colorful and fragrant and rich in nectar majority of insect pollinated flowers are large colorful fragrant and rich in nectar when the flowers are small a number of flowers are clustered into an inflorescence to make them conspicuous animals are attracted to the flowers by color or and are fragrant the flowers pollinated by flies and beetles secrete foul odors to attract these animals the to sustain uh, animal visit the flowers have to provide rewards to the animals nectar and pollen grains are the usual floral rewards the for harvesting the rewards from 
the flower the animal visitor comes in contact with the anthers and the stigma the body of the animal gets a coating of pollen grains which are generally sticky in animal pollinated flower when the animal carrying pollen on its body comes in contact with the stigma it brings about pollination in some species the floral rewards are in providing safe places to lay eggs an example is that the, the tallest flower amorphophallus the flower itself is about 6 feet in height that a similar relationship exists between the species of moth and the plant yucca where both species moth and the plant cannot complete their life cycles without each other moth and the plant yucca are both several both species moth and the plant cannot complete their life cycle without each other amorphophallus and moth and yucca to be remembered the moth deposits its eggs in the locule of the ovary and the flower in turn gets pollinated by the moth the larvae of the moth come out of the eggs as seeds start developing why don't you observe some flowers of the following plants or any others available to you the cucumber mango people coriander papaya onion lobia cotton tobacco rose lemon eucalyptus banana try to find out which animals visit them and whether they could be pollinators you will have to patiently observe the flowers over a few days at a different times of the day you could also try to see where whether uh, there is any correlation in the characteristics of a flower to the animal that visits it carefully observe if any of the visitors come in contact with the anthers and the stigma as only such visitors can bring about pollination many insects may consume pollen or the nectar without bringing about pollination such floral visitors are referred to as pollen or nectar robbers you may or may not be able to identify the pollinator but you will surely enjoy your efforts outbreeding devices uh, next outbreeding devices majority of flowering plants produce hermaphrodite flowers and pollen grains are likely to come in contact with the stigma of the same flower continued self pollination result in inbreeding depression flowering plants have developed many devices to discourage self pollination to encourage cross pollination in some species the pollen release and stigma receptivity is not are not synchronized then either the pollen is released before the stigma before receptive or stigma becomes receptive much before the release of pollen in some other species the anther and stigma are placed at different position that anther and stigma are placed at different position that the, so that the pollen cannot come in contact with the stigma of the same flower both these devices prevent autogamy the third device to prevent inbreeding is self incompatible this is a genetic mechanism and prevents uh, self pollen from the same flower of or other flowers of the same plant from fertilizing the ovule by inhibiting the pollen germination or pollen tube growth in the pistil another device to prevent self pollination is the production of a unisexual flower if both male and female flowers are present on the same plant such as castor and maize which are said to be monoecious it uh, prevents autogamy but not gynogamy it may prevent autogamy but not gynogamy in several species such as papaya male and female flowers are present on different plants in papaya male and female plants are present on different plants that is each plant is either male or female each plant is either male or female by you see this condition prevents both autogamy and uh, dytonogamy so in case of papaya the male female flowers are present on the different plants and that is uh, each plant is either male or female by you see this condition prevents both autogamy and uh, dytonogamy the pollen pistil interaction Poll pollination does not guarantee the transfer of the right type of pollen compatible pollen of the same species as the stigma often 
pollen of the wrong type either from the other species or from the same plant if it is self incompatible also land on the stigma the pistil has the ability to recognize the pollen whether it is of the right type or the compatible one or the wrong type or incompatible one if it is the right type the pistil accept the pollen and promote post pollination events that uh, leads to fertilization if the pollen is of the wrong type the pistil rejects the pollen by preventing pollen germination and the stigma of the pollen tube growth in the style the ability of the pistil to recognize the pollen followed by its acceptance or reject rejection is a result of continuous dialogue between pollen grain and the pistil this dialogue is mediated by the chemical components this dialogue is mediated by chemical components of the pollen interacting with those of the pistil it is only in recent years that botanists have been able to identify some of the pollen and pistil components and the interactions leading to the recognition followed by acceptance or rejection as mentioned earlier the following compatible pollination the pollen grain germinates on the stigma to produce a pollen tube through one of the germ pores as mentioned earlier the following compatible pollination the pollen grain germinates on the stigma to produce a pollen tube through one of the germ pores the contents of the pollen grain the contents of the pollen grain move into the pollen tube pollen tube grows through the tissues of the stigma and style and reaches the ovary you would recall that in some plants pollen grains are shed at a two cell condition a vegetative cell and a generative cell in such plants the generative cell divides and the form the two male gametes generative cell divides the divides and form the two male gametes during the growth of the pollen tube in the stigma in plants which shed pollen in the three cell condition the pollen tubes carry the two male gametes from the beginning pollen tube after reaching the ovary enters the ovule through the micropyle and then enters one of the synergids through the filiform operator the many recent studies have shown that filiform operators present in the micropylar part of the synergid guides the entry of pure pollen tube all these events from pollen deposition on the stigma until pollen tubes enter the ovule are together referred to as pollen pistil interaction as pointed out earlier the pollen pistil interaction is a dynamic process involving pollen recognition followed by promotion or inhibition of the pollen the knowledge gained in this area would help uh, the plant breeder in manipulating a pollen pistil interaction even in incompatible pollination to get desired hybrids so you can easily study pollen germination by dusting some pollen form pollen from flowers such as pea chickpea protelaria balsam and vinca on a glass slide containing a drop of sugar solution about 10% after about 15 to 30 minutes observe the slide under the low power lens of the microscope you are likely to see pollen tube coming out of the pollen grain as you shall learn the chapter in the chapter on plant breeding chapter 9 a breeder is interested in crafting different species and often genera to combine desirable characters to produce the commercially superior varieties artificial hybridization is one of the major approaches of crop improvement program in such crossing experiment it is important to make sure that only the desired pollen grains are used for pollination and stigma is protected for from contamination from unwanted pollen this is achieved by emasculation and bagging techniques this is achieved by emasculation and bagging technique if the female parent bears bisexual flowers the removal of anthers from the flower bud before the anther dehis is using a pair of forceps is necessary this step is referred as emasculation this step is referred as emasculation the female parent bear bisexual flower removal of anthers from the flower bud 
before the answer deficit using a pair of forceps is necessary this step is referred to as emasculation emasculated flowers have to be covered with a bag of suitable size generally made up of a butter paper to prevent uh, contamination of its stigma with unwanted unwanted pollen this process is called bagging emasculated flowers have to be covered with a bag of suitable size generally made up of a butter paper to prevent contamination of its stigma with unwanted pollen this process is called bagging when the stigma is bagged flower attains receptivity mature pollen grains collected from anthers of uh, the male parent are dusted on the stigma and the flowers are rebagged and the fruits allowed to develop when the stigma of bag and flower attain the receptivity mature pollen grains collected from the anthers of the male parent are dusted on the stigma and the flowers are rebagged and the fruits are allowed to develop if the female parent produces unisexual flowers there is no need for emasculation the female flower buds are bagged before the flowers open when the stigma becomes receptive pollination is carried out using the desired pollen and the flower is rebagged double fertilization after entering one of the synergids the pollen tube releases two male gametes into the cytoplasm of the synergid after entering one of the synergid the pollen tube releases the two male gametes into the cytoplasm of the synergid one of the male gametes moves towards the egg cell and fuses with its nucleus thus completing the syngamy this results in the formation of a diploid cell the zygote the other male gamete moves towards the two polar nuclei located in the central cell and fuses with them to produce a triploid primary endosperm nucleus pen as this involves the fusion of three haploid nuclei it is termed triple fusion the so since two types of fusion syngamy and triple fusion takes place syngamy and triple fusion takes place in a embryo sac the phenomenon is termed as double fertilization and even unique to flowering plants the central cell after triple fusion that becomes the primary endosperm cell the central cell after the triple fusion becomes primary endosperm cell and develops into the endosperm while the zygote develops into an embryo so one of the male gametes moves towards the egg cell and then fuses with its nucleus thus completing the syngamy this results in the formation of a diploid cell the zygote the other male gamete moves towards the two polar nuclei located in the central cell and fuses with the, them to produce a triploid primary endosperm nucleus as this involves in the fusion of three haploid nuclei it uh, is a termed uh, triple fusion the since two types of fusion syngamy and triple fusion takes place in an embryo that the phenomenon is termed double fertilization and even unique to the flowering plant this is an even unique to the flowering plant the central cell after the triple fusion becomes the primary endosperm cell and develops into an endosperm while the zygote develops into an embryo in the diagram you can see degenerating synergy zygote primary endosperm primary endosperm that uh, reply regenerating antipodal cell and the globular embryo post fertilization and struct post fertilization structures and events the following double fertilization events of endosperm and embryo development maturation of ovules into seed a seeds and ovary into fruit are collectively termed as post fertilization events endosperm endosperm development precedes embryo development endosperm development precedes embryo development why the primary endosperm cell divides repeatedly and forms a triploid endosperm tissue 
The cells of this tissue are filled with the reserve food materials and are used as the nutrition of the developing embryo. It is the, in the most common type of endosperm development that uh, the pen undergoes uh, the successive nuclear divisions to give rise to the free nuclei. This stage of endosperm development is called free nuclear endosperm. Subsequently, cell wall formation occurs and the endosperm becomes cellular. The number of free nuclei formed before cellularization varies greatly. The coconut water from tender coconut uh, that you are familiar with is nothing but free nuclear endosperm made up of thousands of uh, nuclei. And the surrounding white kernel is the cellular endosperm. The surrounding the white kernel is cellular endosperm. Endosperm may be either be completely consumed by the developing embryo like a pea, groundnut and beans before seed maturation or it may persist in the mature seed like a castor and coconut and be used up during seed germination. Endosperm may either be completely consumed by the developing embryo like a pea, groundnut, beans before seed maturation Endosperm may be either be either be completely consumed by the developing embryo before seed maturation, like pea, groundnut, and bean, or endosperm may persist in a mature seed, mature seed, and be used up during seeding germ seed germination, the like castor and uh, coconut, and be used during seed germination in case of castor and coconut. The split open some seeds of uh, castor. The split open some seeds of castor peas, beans, groundnut, the fruit of coconut, and look for the endosperm in each case. Find out whether the endosperm is persistent in cereals, wheat, rice, and maize. Embryo. Embryo develops the micropylar end of the embryo sac where the zygote is situated. Most zygotes divide only after certain amount of endosperm is formed. Most zygotes divide only after certain amount of endosperm is formed. This is an adaptation to provide assured nutrition to the developing embryo. Though the seeds differ greatly, the early stages of embryo development, embryogeny, are similar in both monocotyledons and dicotyledons. The figure 2.13 depicts the stages uh, of uh, embryogeny in dicotyledonous embryo. The zygote gives rise to the proembryo and subsequently to the globular, heart shaped, and mature embryo. The zygote gives rise to the proembryo and subsequently to the globular, heart shaped, and mature embryo. A typical dicotyledonous embryo consists of embryonal axis and two cartilages. A typical dicotyledonous embryo consists of an embryonal axis and two cartilages. The portion of embryonal axis above the level of cartilage is epicotyle, which terminates with the plumule and the stem tip. The cylindrical portion below the level of cartilage is hypocotyle that terminates at its lower end in the radical or root tip. The root tip is covered with root cap. So, a typical dicotyledonous embryo consists of an embryonal axis and two cartilages. The portion of the embryonal axis above the level of cartilages is epicotyle, which terminates with the plumular stem tip. The cylindrical portion below the level of cartilages is the hypocotyle, the terminates at its lower end in the radical in the radicular root tip. The root tip is covered with a root cap. Embryos of monocotyledons possess only one cartilidin. In the grass family, the cartilidin is called sputellum. That is situated towards one side, lateral side, of the embryonal axis. At its lower end, the embryonal axis has the radical and root cap enclosed in undifferentiated sheath called coelorrhiza. Undifferentiated seeds, uh, sheath called coelorrhiza. The portion of the embryonal axis above the level of attachment of sputellum is 
the epicotyl. Epicotyl has a shoot apex and a, a few leaf primordia enclosed in a hollow foliar structure like a coleoptile. Okay, so uh, the portion of the embryonal axis above the level of attachment of the scutellum is the epicotyl. Epicotyl has a shoot apex and a few leaf primordia enclosed in a hollow foliar structure that uh, that uh, coleoptile, we say. A soak a few seeds in water, say of wheat, maize, peas, chickpeas, groundnut, overnight, then split the seeds and observe the various parts of the embryo and the seed. Let's see the seed here. In angiosperm, the seed is the final product of sexual reproduction. It is often described as a fertilizer ovule. Seeds are formed inside the fruits. A seed typically consists of seed pod, cotyledon, and an embryo axis. Typically consists of seed pod, cotyledon, and an embryo axis. The cotyledons of the embryo are simple structure, generally thick. The cotyledons of the embryo are simple structure, generally thick and swollen due to the storage of food reserves, like in legumes. Mature seeds may be non-albuminous or ex-albuminous. Non-albuminous seeds have the no residual endosperm as it is completely consumed during embryonic development, like pea and uh, groundnut. Albumina seeds retain a part of the endosperm and as it is not completely used up during embryonic development like wheat, maize, barley, castor in them. Occasionally in some seeds such as black pepper and beet, remnants of nucleus are also persistent. Occasionally in some seeds such as black pepper and beet, remnants of nucleus are also persistent. This residual persistent Nucleus is the perisperm. This residual pers persistent nucleus is the perisperm. Integuments of ovules harden as tough protective seed coats. The micropyle remains as a small pore in the seed coat. This facilitates entry of oxygen and water into the seed during germination. As the seed matures, its water content is reduced and seeds become relatively 10 to 15 percent moisture by mass. That uh, the general metabolic activity of the embryo slows down. The embryo may enter a state of activity called dormancy. Or if it uh, if favorable conditions are available, like adequate moisture, oxygen, and suitable temperature, then they germinate. As ovules mature into seeds, the ovary develops into a fruit. As ovules mature into seeds, ovary develops into fruit. That is the transformation of ovules into seeds, ovary into fruit proceeds simultaneously. The wall of the ovary develops into the wall of the fruit is called pericarp. The wall of the ovary develops into the wall of the fruit is called pericarp. The fruits may be fleshy, as in gava, orange, mango, or may be dry, as in groundnut and mustard. Many fruits have evolved mechanism for dispersal of seeds. I recall the classification of the fruits and their dispersal mechanism that you have studied in earlier class. Is there any relationship between the number of ovules in an ovary and the number of seeds present in a fruit? In most plants, by the time the fruit develops from the ovary, other four floral parts degenerate and fall off. However, in a few species such as apple, strawberry, cashew, the thalamus also contributes to fruit formation. The thalamus also contributes to fruit formation in apple, strawberry and cashew. The thalamus also contributes to fruit formation. Such fruits are called false fruits. Most fruits, however, develop only from the ovary and are called uh, true fruits. The fruits which develop from the ovary are called true fruits. Although in most of the species, fruits are the results for fertilization, there are few species in which the fruits develop without fertilization. Such fruits are called parthenocarpic fruits. So fruits which are developed without fertilization are called 
पार्थेनो कार्पिक फ्रूट बनाना इज वन सच एग्जांपल पार्थेनो कार्पि बनाना इज वन सच अ गुड एग्जांपल पार्थेनो कार्पि कैन बी इंड्यूस्ड थ्रू द एप्लीकेशन ऑफ द ग्रोथ हार्मोन सच एज फ्रूट्स द फ्रूट्स कैन बी सीडलेस सीड्स ऑफर सेवरल एडवांटेजेस टू एंजियोस्पर्म्स फर्स्टली since uh, reproductive processes such as pollination and fertilization are independent of water seed formation is more dependable also seeds have better adaptive strategies for dispersal to new habitats help the species to colonize in other areas as they have sufficient food reserves young seedlings are nourished until they are capable of photosynthesis on their own the hard seed coat provide protection to the young embryo being products of uh, sexual reproduction they generate new genetic combinations leading to variation seed is the basis for agriculture dehydration and dormancy of mature seeds are the crucial for storage of seeds which can be used as a food throughout the year and also raise crop in the next season can you imagine agriculture in the absence of seeds or in the presence of seeds which germinate straight away soon after formation and cannot be stored how long do the seeds remain alive after they are dispersed this period again varies greatly in a few species of seeds lose viability within a few months seeds of a large number of species live for several years some of, some seeds can remain alive for hundreds of years there are several records very old at viable seed the oldest is that of lupin the lupinus arc rab that arcticus lupinus arcticus excavated from arctic tundra The oldest is that uh, here that uh, lupin, that uh, lupinus arcticus, that I have excavated from Arctic tundra. The seed germinated and flowered after an estimated record of ten thousand years of Darwin. A recent record of two thousand years old viable seed is of the date palm, the phoenix, and uh, uh, dactyli fera, discovered during the archaeological excavation at uh, King. Herod's place near the Dead Sea. So, date palm, phoenix, and dicardiifera discovered during the archaeological excavation at King Herod's place, palace uh, near the King Herod, King Herod's place, palace near the Dead Sea. Uh, that two uh, thousand years old viable seeds they are. After completing a brief account of the sexual reproduction of flowering plants, it would be worth attempting to comprehend the enormous reproductive capacity of some flowering plants by asking the following questions: How many eggs are present in an embryo sac? How many embryo sacs are present in an ovule? How many ovules are present in an ovary? How many ovaries are present in a typical flower? How many flowers are present on a tree? And so on. Can you think of some plants in which fruits contain very large number of seeds? Like orchid fruits are one such category, and each fruit contains thousands of tiny seeds. Similar is the case in fruits of some parasitic species, such as orobanke and striga. Have you seen a tiny seed of ficus? How large is the tree of ficus developed from that tiny seed? How many billions of seeds does each the ficus tree produce? Can you imagine any other example in which such a tiny structure can produce a large biomass over the years? Also, up next, let's see here. Apomixis and polyembryo. Also, seeds in general are the products of fertilization. A few flowering plants, such as some species of uh, Asteraceae and grasses have evolved a special mechanism to produce seeds without fertilization called apomixis. Okay, so the few flowering plants, such as some species of asteraceae and grasses, have evolved a special mechanism to produce seeds without fertilization called apomixis. What is fruit production without fertilization called? Thus, apomixis is a form of asexual reproduction that mimics sexual reproduction. There are several ways of development of apomixic seeds. In some species, the diploid egg cell is formed without reduction division and develops into embryo without fertilization. More often, in many like citrus and mango, 
varieties, some of the nuclear cells surrounding the embryo sac start dividing and protrude into the embryo sac and develop into embryos. In such species, each ovule contain many embryos. Occurrence of more than one embryo in seed is referred to as polyembryony. Take out some seeds of orange and squeeze them. Observe the many embryos of different sizes and shapes from each seed. Count the number of embryos in each seed. What would be the genetic nature of apomictic embryos? Can they be called clones? Hybrid varieties of several of uh, our food and vegetable crops are being extensively cultivated. Cultivation of hybrids has tremendously increased the productivity. One of the problems of hybrids is that hybrid seeds have to be produced every year. If the seeds collected from hybrids are sown, the plants in the progeny will segregate and do not uh, maintain hybrid character. Production of hybrid seeds is costly and uh, hence the cost of hybrid seeds become too expensive for the farmer. If these hybrids made into apomates, if these hybrids made into apomates, there is no segregation of the characters in the hybrid progeny. Then the farmers can keep on using the hybrid seeds to raise new crop uh, after year and he does not have to buy hybrid seeds every year. Because the importance of apomixes in hybrid seed industry. The active research is going on in many laboratories around the world to understand the genetics of apomixes to transfer apomictic genes into hybrid varieties. This is all about the sexual reproduction in flowering plants. I request you to repeat and revise and record that uh, repeated reading is very important in NCRT. Okay, so then uh, that is about the sexual reproduction in flowering plants. Sexual